So we are at the tail end of our semester now. We are going to do a little bit about, a little bit more about phase diagrams and solutions, just a bit, and then we'll move to the final topic, which is chemical equilibrium. I could do more topics after that, but I think it's an in interest of everyone to look at, do a revision instead of the full semester. And that's what we will be doing. So, and in general, if you have any questions about the semester, any, any topic starting from very beginning till the very end, please post them on Slack. You can put them to me in direct message or on any of the channels, and I will make sure to answer them uh, either on Slack directly or I will bring it up in the classroom. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if no more, if, if no questions, then I want to talk about a, a final type of phase diagram. So phase diagrams are rich. They keep going on as much as you wish. We looked, one of the examples we looked at was, of course, we looked at a pressure temperature phase diagram for one component system where you had different phases existing like this. We looked at temperature composition diagram for a liquid vapor phase diagram where you had liquid plus vapor, liquid and vapor. And we understood why these forms arise. Hopefully, hopefully it should be, if, if not, then once you go back and look at your notes, you will be able to see that they arise due to free energies, how free energies talk to each other, how free energies move around, and that's, that's all there is. The most important thing to understanding phase diagrams is to understand T, dg is equal to tds minus vdp plus summation mu i d and i. This is really the heart of phase diagrams. So the third and final type of phase diagram that we are going to look at connects to something called phase separation. And it happens in something that you have probably seen in real life or in, uh, in, in a lab, which is also real life, I guess, phase separation in partially miscible liquids. So we are again talking about a two component system and uh, where you can think about the composition of the other liquid that you're thinking of. So for example, this could be oil plus water. And for those of you who have done organic chemistry lab, a uh, typical example that happens there is diethyl ether plus water. And more generally, this happens with one liquid polar and one liquid nonpolar. So if you have experienced this, or you can imagine what goes on here is as you start so let's say you start with just pure water and you start to add more and more oil in it. For some time, it will mix with the water. You won't be able to tell what's going on. But soon enough, depending on the temperature. So if you're at a higher temperature, it tends to mix more and more. If you're at a very high temperature, it will keep mixing across any concentration. But if you are at some temperature and you add oil to, so this is water, and let's say you're adding oil to it and let's say the mole fraction of oil here we are calling it xb and the mole fraction of water is xa such that xa plus xp is equal to one so it's it's a composition temperature phase diagram that we are interested in but it's not composition of a species it's composition of the second liquid so as you add more and more oil in it so first it will look as if water plus oil mix and you won't be able to tell. This will happen for XB very, very small, XP very small. Once you increase the XP, at some point, and I'm going to draw a snapshot of how it looks like under a microscope or even to the plane eye, you will see that in the water, some oil rich droplets start to appear, right? We, we have all seen this when, I mean, uh, in oily food, for example, you have droplets of oil that starts to appear here and there. It's not mixing well. As you keep increasing the XB, at some point, it will again become, at, at very, very high XB, 
it's going to look basically pure oil, right? XP close to one, it's going to be pure oil. So you could have imagined this from the other direction. If you are adding some water to oil, then, then let's say the oil is dark colored. So here you have dark colored droplets that appeared. Now the whole thing will be dark colored with droplets of water that have started to appear, right? The bulk of it will be dark colored. And so <clears throat> let's, let's try to think of it in the context of a phase diagram, how it's going to look at. In the context of a phase diagram, the thing that we just drew over here, where you start with water, you add some oil, it tends to mix water plus oil. If you add more oil, little bit of droplets of oil start to appear. If you add more and more oil, then the whole thing becomes oil rich and you, as if you feel as if little bit few droplets of water have started to appear. And finally, at concentration close to one, it's only oil. And this transition region, transition XB, at which the first droplets of oil tend to appear, this transition value increases with temperature. If you are at a higher temperature, you can keep adding more and more oil until the first droplets of oil tend to appear. So let's look at it, how it looks like in a temperature composition phase diagram. It looks quite simple, yet it is quite interesting. So here XP is zero to one. It will look something like this. So I'm going to draw a dashed line over here. So this, these are all single phase regions. Single phase, single phase, single phase. These are all single phase region. But this phase here, alpha, and this phase here, beta, are different. This is A-rich single phase, and this is B-rich single phase. And in the middle, you have double phase of alpha plus beta. So why does this happen, and why is it that a particular temperature you can think of it as a critical temperature. It is a critical temperature. Beyond this temperature, it doesn't matter. If you go to a very high temperature, oil and water or whatever two liquids you're thinking of will be perfectly miscible across any composition. It won't make a difference. So in order to understand this, do we have at our, so now that you are trained and you have tolerated me for 34 classes and I have thrown as much equation, way more equations that you would have liked on, on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. But hopefully these equations have made you ready. They have given you the machinery to deal with complicated physical scenarios, right? So to deal with this scenario where I'm describing to you that you have a two component system and at a low temperature or a low enough temperature, there is a mixing of the phases there is phase, this, so this, this behavior is called phase separation. You have different, you have two phases that separate out. So do we have the right machinery to address this? Can anyone help me with this? Do we have, what model should we use to explain this behavior? Why does this happen at a low temperature? Why does this disappear at a high temperature? Do we have any insight, any ideas? Or I'm stuck and we have nothing to do this class, so I need some ideas. Um, is it because in the um, DG equation, temperature is tied to entropy? That's a right start. That's a good start. It's, it's related to how temperature is tied to entropy. That's absolutely correct. So, so uh, Jared, your explanation is absolutely correct at high temperature. At high temperature, we know entropy is going to dominate, right? And if entropy dominates, things would like to mix. But why this behavior? What is the model that we should use here? Have we looked at a model that might explain this? Hint, solution model? Could we explain this using a regular solution model? The answer is yes, let's see how. So first of all, so thanks, thanks Jared. If it was an ideal solution, entropy would dominate and we would never get two phase region, it wouldn't happen. 
But we have seen that for a regular solution model, the Gibbs free energy of mixing is given by omega xa xp plus rt, and this is per mole, xa ln xa plus xp ln xp, and omega not equal to zero in general for, uh, for a regular solution model. And recall we looked at this specific case that with omega more than zero and high omega, if omega is positive and more than zero, then we drew these diagrams where we said that the delta H mixing is always going to look like this. This is our omega XA XP term and minus T delta mixing S is always going to look like this. So if T is very high, if T is very high, this term dominates, right? And we are left with a mixing free energy curve that looks like this. And I'm being sloppy about the slopes. Be careful about, careful with slopes, how they meet at the zero line, right? So in this case, there is no phase separation. We have a single phase that just exists. But we also looked at a case when omega is positive and the temperature is not too high. If the temperature is not too high, then this curve moves up over here, right? Our minus T delta mix S looks something, and this is zero. This is the zero curve, right? Why did it move up? Because the temperature is not that high. So the whole thing moved up. And now you have omega XA XP that looks something like this. Again, I say careful with slopes because we know this T delta mix S drops down with a slope of minus infinity. So it's going to dominate. But in the middle region, we are going to have a curve that looks something like this. This is going to be our delta mixing G. It will, it will go down when X, when the concentration starts to increase but then it will go up. Let's blow this up. Let's zoom up, zoom in on this. It's going to look something like this. So I have just zoomed in. We did this for the regular solution model. And that's the best model to explain this behavior. As you reach this concentration over here, in so you start with phase alpha, you start with, phase, and, and on this end you have phase beta, but in the middle points, for the middle points, we can draw a common tangent and see that the free energy is going to be lower if you instead exist as a combination of a phase given by alpha with composition X1. And it, it looks as if you are in two phases. It, even though it's the same phase, it looks you have two concentrations that exist. So this will be our water rich in the model that we are talking about. And this will be our oil rich phase in the composition that we are talking about. And that's, that's how we explain this. And uh, you can see why this disappears with temperature. We have already answered our question. At very, very uh, high temperature, it becomes an ideal model. The enthalpy, this just does not matter because the RT terms starts to dominate, right? So we are left with no phase separation. Careful with slopes, I did not see the chat messages, sorry. So, yeah, the reason I say careful with slopes, because if you're not careful with slopes, how could you ever say that at X tends to zero, which one dominates, the entropy or the enthalpy? At X tends to zero, entropy always dominates because of how this, we plotted this in class, right? So this is phase separation. It looks very abstract. It's extremely, extremely prevalent in nature, as you see in oil and water, in diethyl ether and water. It shows up in lots of other contexts also. Does anyone here know what other, has anyone, does anyone happen to know what other contexts in real life this might show up? I'm looking for a geology answer. No geologists? Okay, it happens in the Earth's crust, my wife tells me. So it happens 
or, or in volcanoes, not in the Earth's crust. In volcanoes, apparently, phase separation happens a lot. Oil spills, well, oil spills is a clear one, yes, of course. So it's really uh, common to happen. And now if I ask you, what is the composition? What is What fraction will you have of this phase over here? And what fraction will you have of this phase over here? You can use your liver rule. Yeah, I, I, yeah. This is this is. Uh, I see a chat message. Do you mean liquid miscibility? Yeah, that's that's what we're talking about. So here, we have a difference in miscibility between the two liquids. You have alpha is a liquid which is A rich, beta is a liquid which is B rich, and in the middle you will exist as a combination of two liquids. And uh, the regular solution model explains it quite clearly. One thing I would have liked to do, but I'm not going to do in this semester because we are running short of time. But for those of you who are interested, I want to point it out. There is something even more interesting that happens in this phase diagram. You, you will see a second curve, and I'm drawing it in color green, that exists inside this first curve. And this curve is called the spinodal curve. And this region is also a two-phase region, but the physics changes completely. And in order to find this concentration, so here you can see that, let's, let's go to a new page and, and draw this. So we had a phase diagram. And this is temperature, this is composition. And we were interested at a particular temperature, T is equal to T1. And this is our TC. And we had phase alpha and we had phase beta. And we explained that at this temperature, we have a two phase region because the free energy tends to look something like this. And we said that at any point over here, it's better for it to drop instead of staying with this composition. So if, if we are at this composition X2, it is better for it to break into two other compositions, X1 and X3, that you can get from the common tangent construction. So X2, because this one has a higher free energy, it's better for it to move into this free energy over here, which is a combination of X1 and X3. So at this phase diagram, you have an X1 and X3. But there is a special point here at which the curvature goes to zero. And let's call that one as X, X1 prime and x3 prime and if you plot that point over here the x1 prime and x3 prime you will you can do this for any uh, any temperature of interest and you will get a new curve that looks something like this which stays inside the first curve and this region is called spinodal decomposition and the reason why it is so interesting, and that's when we will stop with this phase diagram, is as follows. Once you start to add, let's draw a few composition boxes over here. So let's say this is x less than x1 and this is x more than x3 at t is equal to t1, okay? So those are not the point of maximum slope. These are the points at which partial square g by partial xb square is equal to zero. These are the inflection points in the free energy because you can see here the slope is increasing until you go till here. And finally, beyond this, the slope is decreasing. So there is one point at which the slope, the curvature becomes zero. So if you look at, and I'm going to plot water using, and again, let's use water oil as our example. At very less composition, you are just going to have water. At very high composition, you're just going to have oil or something that looks like water mixed with oil, but primarily water. And at very high composition, you have oil mixed with water, but primarily oil, right? So this is, this is what happens. Once you go to a composition where you are between X 
x1 and x1 prime. So you have not caught quite crossed this point of zero curvature over here. Let's say you are in this region where the curvature is still increasing. It's not gone down to zero. Over here, you will have primarily liquid, uh, primarily water, but small droplets of oil will start to appear. Similarly, at the other end, when you are x3 prime at a composition like this, where you have x3 prime less than x, less than x3, then it's again going to be primarily oil, but small droplets of water start to appear. If you're in one of these middle concentrations, if you are in this region over here, actually, it is going to be two-phase, any of this region in between here. It's going to be two-phase, but it won't look like droplets. It's going to look something super different. It's going to look as if you have extended regions of oil. Let's see how well can I draw it. You will have extended regions of oil that seem to appear on its own. It won't be just small droplets. You will have long, long regions of oil and similarly long, long regions of water that coexist along with this. So the microstructure looks completely different. And this is called spinodal, spinodal decomposition behavior. And the reason for this is that this one is barrierless. The barrier disappears. And that's why I said I'm not going to go too much into this, but you can go and read up on spinal decomposition. I'm not going to cover this in the exam. Spinal decomposition is purely for your own uh, intellectual pleasure. You can go and read up on it and you will see quickly that in this region, the barrier completely disappears. As soon as you form a little bit of liquid, it can keep growing more and more and more and more and more and will just keep growing. In material science, you might have seen similar things in the context of something called dendritic growth. You form dendrites and they keep growing more and more and more. While in these two other regions, you have a barrier and the growth mechanism is something called nucleation and growth, which we saw earlier in our AR square minus BR cube type term. There is a penalty that needs to be played. So that's why you have little droplets that appear. Some of the droplets continue to go big, but most of them cannot. You just have small droplets that stay because they have to cross that barrier to go over. So this is our final topic in phase diagrams. Phase diagrams continue more and more. This curve that I have drawn over here is the curve that is at the heart of phase diagrams with the common tangent construction. Anytime you have a curvature existing in a free energy curve, you have to think about separation into two phases and think about common tangents. Why do you care about common tangents? Because that's when the chemical potentials are equal, right? Because the slope of a free energy curve is chemical potential. And calculating phase diagrams is all about equating chemical potential. In your later studies, you will, many of you will probably come across very, very complicated phase diagrams with lots of phases, lots of free energy curves. If you keep this common tangent construction in mind, uh, you will be fine. The phase diagram on its own cannot distinguish how the microstructure looks. That's another story to keep in mind. If you think about single phase versus two phase region, anything inside the, this first curve is going to look like alpha plus beta. Anything entire, entire it will be two phase region, alpha plus beta. However, if you go inside this spinoidal dome, then you have a microstructure that looks very different. These all three of them are two phase regions. You have phase alpha and phase beta, but how they grew is completely different. And that kind of tells us there is phase diagrams you have, they might not be complete. You have to go and think about the growth mechanism and then kinetics starts to play a role, which we are not talking about. Okay, any questions? Before we move past phase diagrams, finally. Spinal decomposition, I will not be asking any question to you, but I recommend if you have time to go and look it up on the internet, you will find lots and lots of uh, examples and applications of spinal de decomposition. So, and by the way, so this one final comment is that this outside curve is called miscibility gap. 
and this in inside curve is called spinoidal gap or spinoidal curve. These are names that you will come across. Okay, let's move on. So regular solution can be helpful. It can explain a lot of things. It's not perfect, all right? Because why is it not perfect? Regular solution still assumed that delta mixing of entropy, the entropy change due to mixing is the same as an ideal solution, right? So let's look at our hierarchy. How did we start? We started with ideal solution. We said delta mixing H is equal to zero and delta mixing S is equal to delta mixing S ideal which had a term that looked like xi log xi, right? That was the term. And this was the reason for the negative slope and everything. And there is a chat message. Can you send something in the Slack about the dendritic cells and barrierless concept? Yeah, Elizabeth, just send me a message there. I will pin it and I'll make sure to respond. Okay, so this was our ideal solution. In our regular solution, oh, I also want to make one, uh, one more comment. People at Facebook or my computer scientist friends who work at Facebook and Twitter or in general at many, many companies, a lot of computer scientists are very interested in such models of phase diagrams, especially in the context of statistical mechanics. And you can imagine why. Let's imagine you are thinking about how to flip voters from Republican to Democrat, right? In this case, you can flip voters, but you can only have effect local. But if you could model the system using some sort of thing where you can affect huge spots of people, right? And not just voting priorities, but also any type of mindset. So when people use these things to model uh, sociology and psychology, how do people act as, as do, do people change their minds only in small clusters or can you have change in system that goes from one end of the system to another end of the system? When this happens, they want to understand what is the physics governing this? And they go and use models not very different from this regular solution type equation. And a hint for this was when we talked about, or I told you about Shannon entropy or the entropy of information. So the phase diagrams are not just an archaic topic from 80 years ago. They, they play a huge role in computer science and artificial intelligence. If you want to really understand how to model behavior of people, phase diagrams are quite useful. So, but let's get back to our 80 year old stuff, which is ideal solution, regular solution. We have, so ideal solution, delta mixing H was zero and delta mixing S we calculated assuming ideal gas. And that was XI ln XI type term. Then we went to a regular solution. We said, well, delta mixing S is still going to be equal to the ideal entropy of mixing. However, let's change this delta mixing edge and make it non-zero and let's make it proportional to the mole fraction of A and to the mole fraction of B. And this proportionality constant was called omega. And I showed you that this omega was related to, well, I told you, I did not show you, I gave some extra notes for those who were interested. It was related to the depth of the uh, energy well. It, it was, and I might have a sign missing here, so I'm just going to use modulus both sides to be safe. But you can go and look up the sign. This was our regular solution model. But why should it apply to real solutions? In real solutions, why should you have that the enthalpy of mixing is only proportional to mole fraction of A and mole fraction to B, why should it be proportional? Why cannot it be some other complicated function? And secondly, the entropy, why should it be the ideal entropy of mixing? So that brings us to real solutions. Well, real life is complicated. Real solutions are very complicated. So in this case, our delta mixing H will be non-zero and it will not necessarily be equal to omega XA, XB. Right? It might turn out to be that omega XA, XB is a good model even for a, real, for a certain real solution, but you don't expect that to be true. And most importantly, delta mixing S is not going to be true 
and not going to be equal to the delta mixing ideal of s. So what do we do in this case? Can we calculate our delta mixing s? The answer is no. It becomes super, super complicated to calculate the entropy if you go beyond the ideal solution model. There are methods to do it. One of them is called cluster variation method. It was pioneered by someone named Kikuchi in 1950s. And again, this is one of the things I find fascinating about old school thermodynamics is how it shows up in modern artificial intelligence. These type of ideas are very much at the heart of uh, AI type uh, models, but that's another story. So the difference between regular and real solutions, once again, is that regular solutions assume the entropy to be coming from ideal solutions. Real solutions do not assume that. Real solutions say the entropy is going to be whatever. There are complicated ways to calculate it rigorously, but these are extremely, extremely complicated. You can go and Google for this name and you can look up his papers from 1950s. It's, I forget the name of the journal, I can send you the reference and you will see how complicated it is. So regular solutions, we were in the nice land, to answer your question, Noel, where we just assumed the regular ideal solution entropy, which was our Xi log Xi term. Now we are going to let it be anything. If we let it be anything, how do we deal with it? What is the equation that we write down? That we have to take a different approach. In order to do that, we have to start with an equation. So how do we Regular solutions, <laughs> it's, it's just a theoretical model. It's, don't call it just another theoretical model. It's a theoretical model which can be quite helpful. It can be quite helpful. For example, you can make your omega term concentration dependent. Then you can get away with more complications. And then the beauty of regular solution model is that this entropy approximation of x log x actually works quite well. And I will show you how to correct for it. So it's it's, it is a theoretical model, but it, it's, it's a very powerful theoretical model. And I will show you now how people go and correct for it. They like this theoretical model so much that for real, for real solutions, so in order to write delta mixing G for real, these frameworks are helpful and we will see how. So in order to write down our delta mixing G, I mean, to answer your question, Noel, all of this is wrong. We should all be doing quantum mechanics, reality. If you, are, if you are a biochemist, you are talking about biological systems existing in water. Water is heavily quantum mechanical. How do we deal with that? So we can get depressed and say all of these are crappy models. No one cares about them. But even these crappy models are quite useful and uh, they can take you quite, quite far. A lot of phase diagrams look just like this. If you use a regular solution model, and try to capture it, you can capture many of the things in such complicated phase diagrams, even spinal decomposition. So it, it is really powerful, even though it's just a simple, deceptively simple theoretical model. But let's talk about real solutions. In order to do this, let's remind ourselves of something we wrote down for an ideal mixture of A and B. For an ideal mixture of A and B, we wrote down that the chemical potential of B must be mu B naught plus RT ln XP. Right? We showed this in class that the chemical potential of B goes like this and similarly the chemical potential of A goes to some chemical potential of the pure species plus RT, ln, XA, right? So this is going to be true only for ideal mixtures. For real mixtures, what do we do? We say, we define something. So let's go to the next page because we are going to spend some time with this. So for ideal mixture, we have mu B, is equal to mu b naught plus rt ln xb. For real mixture, this is not going to be true. 
so what what does this mean this means that mu b minus mu b naught is equal to rt ln xb or xb is equal to e to the power mu b minus mu b naught by rt right so if you calculate your e to the power if you calculate your chemical potential, subtract out a reference value from it, divide it by RT and take its exponential, you will get the mole fraction. This is not going to be true in general. For a real mixture, if you calculate e to the power mu B minus mu B naught by RT, it's not going to be the same as the mole fraction of B it will be something, I don't know what it is. So what people say, said is to say that this thing, I'm going to define it as the activity of B and I'm going to give it a new name, small a for activity and subscript B. So I am defining my activity of the species B as e to the power mu B minus mu B naught by RT. Okay, where mu b naught is the chemical potential of this pure species B. Similarly, you can define activity of the species A as e to the power mu A minus mu A naught by RT. What does this mean? This means that mu b is equal to mu b naught plus RT ln A activity of B and mu A is equal to mu A naught plus RT ln activity of A. So we have preserved the form of this equation by introducing a new quantity called activity. Activities, yeah, so this is A, C, T, I, V, I, T, Y, activity. For an ideal mixture, activity of B is the same as the mole fraction of B. There is no difference for a real mixture it won't be the same and they are related through something called the activity coefficient so at this point thermodynamics real thermodynamics is all about fudge factors introducing fudge factors to preserve our well-loved forms you might say well what is activity it's really nothing it's really defined in an inverse way it's really defined as something that preserves our ideal solution form, our ideal mixture form. So, and this gamma B is the activity coefficient for B. The reason I'm doing activity as a last topic is, is because it also it is also our foray into uh, equilibrium constants. Equilibrium constants are often expressed in terms of activities. So, and gamma B could be more than one, gamma B could be less than one, gamma B could be dependent on concentration. Most of the times gamma B itself will depend on concentration. So, and uh, so a lot of real thermodynamics, real thermodynamics, or real solution thermodynamics is often about figuring out gamma B, the activity coefficient, and through it, AB, the activity itself. Once you can figure out the activity, then you can go and use all the machinery that we have developed for regular solution, it all stays the same. All of the things that we have been writing down over here, all these models in one form or the other might be useful, these ways of thinking, because we have preserved this oh, U, mu b is equal to mu b naught plus rt ln x b equation. We have preserved it. Now we can go and talk about delta mixing g and everything. Instead of x b, we will, act, we will have a b and the whole machinery remains the same. The end will be, you will be calculating the free energy curve and moving from there. And you might say, well, what about enthalpy? What about entropy? 
the reason I don't have to distinguish between them, both of them now, is because I'm talking directly about mu. And mu is chemical free energy, right? Mu directly is the free energy. So if you start to work with mu b, now you can calculate delta mixing g can be calculated directly from equations like mu b is equal to mu b naught plus rt ln a b. And instead of your mole fraction, you will have this activity showing up everywhere, which you need to calculate. There is no way to get gamma b from theory. Okay, that's the thing that has to be kept in mind. Cannot be obtained from theory. In order to obtain gamma b, either you have to run expensive calculations like the type I do in my lab using quantum mechanics, for example, or even classical mechanics, you can get your activity coefficients. These things are called molecular dynamics, MD, or you have to go and measure it in actual experiments. You have to perform your experiment and measure the chemical potential by seeing how things are moving from side A to side B and fit it. It's, it's complicated. You cannot just do theory to get it. But once you, have a, once you have your measurement of gamma B, then you can reproduce, you can use all the machinery that we have done so far. One final comment on activity is that it is also connected to fugacity which we saw earlier very briefly. And we did not spend a lot of time. Yeah, it's hard to calculate gamma B. I cannot just make you a model and calculate it. In order to calculate gamma B, I would have to think about entropy beyond the ideal gas approximation. That is extremely hard. I don't know how to do it. Kikuchi tried and other people tried, but it's extremely hard. So cannot is always a uh, dangerous word to say. One of you will go and write a paper and then say, how I proved my professor wrong, I put cannot in quotes, it's hard to get it. Typically the way it is obtained is by running calculations, molecular dynamics calculations or quantum mechanics calculations, or by doing experiments. That's how you get it, right? So it's, it's no, there is no easy way. I cannot just do it on pen and paper, it's tricky. So activity is connected to fugacity. Fugacity was the last time we saw how non-ideal behavior shows up. And we did not spend too much time uh, uh, talking about fugacity and similarly we are not going to spend too much time talking about activity but once you see these terms you are ready to know what they actually mean in, in your practical work if, if, and I hope you do use thermodynamics in one form or the other. So how do we connect it to fugacity? So remind, let's remind ourselves when, when we saw fugacity, we saw fugacity in the context of G is equal to G naught plus RT ln F by P naught, right? So now if you're thinking about a species B, you can say mu B is equal to mu B naught plus RT ln fugacity of species B by pressure P naught. Therefore, if you compare this, this term to, I should have numbered equations. Let's call it equation number one, equation number two. Compare one with two and you have the same thing. So therefore, AB is equal to FB by P naught. This is going to be true for a pure gas that the activity coefficient and knowing the fugacity is the same as knowing the activity coefficient uh, or the activity for a pure gas. And in turn, we know FB is equal to phi B fugacity coefficient multiplied by pressure by P naught. So this is both are true for pure gas. If you have a mixture, then 
all you need to do is to write down phi b and instead of p you will have x b multiplied by p divided by p naught right you have a mole fraction that comes into play And that's all I have to say about activity. It's complicated, it's hard to get, but it essentially captures how much you deviate. So the fugacity coefficient and, so you can see now that the activity coefficient gamma B is equal to fugacity coefficient divided by this. So they are related, knowing one of these is equivalent to knowing the other and it tells us about how non-ideal we are. How do we get these coefficients? By doing experiments in the lab or by running complicated calculations. Why is it worth it to do this? Because once you do this, you preserve your simple relation mu b is equal to mu b naught plus rt ln ab. Once you have such a relation, you know how to go and calculate you're mixing free energies in this and that. You did it for the real solution. Now you will be doing it for the ideal solution. And that's, that's how real thermodynamics happens in geology, in petroleum industry, in chemistry labs, in material science. This is really where thermodynamics is put into action. And you cannot, it's, it's hard to quantify the number of uh, hundreds of billions of dollars every year in processing or in manufacturing or some other form that are a direct consequence of using this equation. This is possibly one of the most important equations in science. It's easy to say E is equal to MC square is my favorite equation. Equations such as mu B is equal to mu B naught plus RT and NAB get sidelined. But these are actually in dollar value, this is probably an even more important equation. So next time, uh, I have two minutes left, so I'm not going to start a new topic today. Next time, I'm going to talk about equilibrium constants, which basically will tell us that once you have a reaction going from A to B, will this reaction dominate or will the opposite uh, direction dominate? And in order to do that, we will just use our second law of thermodynamics that the spontaneous direction is the one in which the free energy decreases. So Zach, you can see your equation number one. That was, this was equation number one, this very, very important equation, mu b is equal to mu b naught plus RT ln AB. So next time we will talk about the equilibrium constant. It is, it is one class worth material. We will de define equilibrium constant. We will talk about something called uh, Le Chatelier principle, pardon my French. And as soon as we finish that, I could have done electrochemistry and kinetics, but if you have understood what we have done, electrochemistry is a very straightforward application. Atkins has a chapter on it. You can go and read if you understand these terms, these notions of free energy and equilibrium constant, electrochemistry is quite easy. Kinetics would have taken many, many lectures, so I'm going to skip that. So once we finish equilibrium constant and relationship with the principle, probably next time uh, on Wednesday, then Friday, Monday and Wednesday, the three classes are going to be 100% review, starting from the very, very beginning. I'm going to open my notes and walk you through them. If there are specific topics that you want me to cover, you know, then let me know on Slack. Now is your time so that Friday, Monday and Wednesday, I can cover all those. After that, you have at least all of Wednesday, all of Thursday next week to ask me more questions. And next week, Friday, December 9th, the final will be released. I am grading midterm and uh, I will get you your grade. I said Wednesday, it might be by Friday. Definitely this week, you will have your grade in it. Unless uh, you will get a good grade in it unless you have really not put in the effort. It's really effort based. So I wouldn't worry about it. If you have put in effort, you have nothing to worry about. And, um, and the funniest videos, I will pick three and I will have you all poll and pick the one funniest video from the three, which is for the, don't worry about what, don't worry about life. No, I said, don't worry about the second winter grades. If you have put in effort, you will do great. It will take me a few days to grade it. And no office hour today, uh, but next week I will have office hour and also three classes are full like mega office hours. So come and talk to me in them. 
Okay, see you all on Wednesday.